Well, hello there, and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell, and we are today moving on with Axis aircraft. Although, Greg, this is kind of the Axis and the Allies, because the Italians, who we're going to cover today, kind of uh, switch sides midway through the war. But the, uh, we're talking about Italian aircraft. We're going to do four very rare Italian aircraft. Now, before I do that, Greg, I think there's two things here. One is we're getting close to Halloween. The other is you're kind of making fun of my Italian heritage, I think, with the, you know, you'll sleep with a fish hat here. I think, so I'm gonna toss this off camera. He got it, good job for the Kenny. So we are talking today about, now this is probably one of the best little fighters that you've never heard of, and that is the Machi, the C-202, the Fulgore, which was in Italian, the Thunderbolt. Now the Fulgore was a Italian single engine fighter that first flew in 1940. It was introduced in 1941. I'll go ahead and give you a plan view of the airplane. Uh, it had a, uh, it was a liquid cooled aircraft. It was retired, if you can believe that, Greg, in 1951, relatively low build rate at 1,150. Now it uh, flew for the Regia Aeronautica, which was the uh, Royal Air Force, a Royal Italian Air Force. Its designer, there's gonna be a lot of, this is gonna be like the godfather here. There's gonna be a lot of real heavy Italian names here. Mario Castoldi. Now Mario was a, probably one of the most important high speed designers of uh, aircraft in the late, the early to the late 1930s. He uh, designed uh, aircraft for the Schneider uh, Cup, the trophy, trophy cups. The most important aircraft that he did in that uh, vein was the MC.72, uh, which at that time was the world's fastest aircraft. Now that is very important when we start talking about the 202. Now the 202 was derived from the C200 and it developed into the C205. Now the 202 fought in Malta, it fought in North Africa, it also fought on the Eastern Front uh, and it soldiered on even after the Italians signed the armstead. Now, now the thing about it, which is really interesting, Greg, is that this aircraft had a better kill ratio than the ME-109, the BF-109, if you can believe that. Uh, it actually had a better kill ratio. Now, it had some challenges. The biggest challenges with this aircraft was it actually could spin quite easily. It was very toughly constructed, but the challenge was the Italians with Fiat. If you're a Fiat uh, fan, I don't, I'm going to rain on your parade here a little bit. But Fiat could not deliver enough engines for this aircraft, and they were very unreliable. So eventually the Italians opted to get a copy of the Dahmer Benz engine, which we've talked about before, to put in this fighter. Now how slick was this fighter? How aerodynamically slick was it? This aircraft, and wait for it, Greg. I want you to wait for it. My Snully Goster assistant, I want you to wait for it. Snully Goster, that is like an October word. I have no idea what Snully Goster means but I'm sure it would, it's appropriate for October. But it was so slick that this aircraft actually dealt with compressibility issues in the, in the dive. We've talked about that with later uh, American aircraft that in the dive they were dealing with speed of sound compression. This aircraft was no different. Now its challenge was not only its engine, it didn't have very good radios, uh, it had some challenges with its cooling system, but you want to know what the biggest problem was with it? It was probably one of the best Italian designs of the war. Maybe even, and I'm going to tell you in a minute, the aircraft that it's comparable to, you'll see how good it really was. As I said, it's probably one of the best fighters you've never heard of. But the biggest mistake that they made with this airplane, if you can call it a mistake, was it was lightly armed. The Italians went with a couple of machine guns, two in each wing, and eyebrow 
you know, firing through the propeller, but they were a low caliber weapons compared to we've talked to. I'm going to put this down because this is very important for a fighter. You've got to be able to hit hard enough to shoot down the enemy. This, if Greg can get a shot of that, this is the 50 caliber shell. Lots of kinetic energy with that, which is one reason why the gun is still in use today. This is a 30 caliber shell, which is comparable to a 7.62 round or those uh, a little bit higher rounds or, or maybe what you'd call a NATO round today. The reality of the situation with this is look at the stopping power in those two uh, slugs. This airplane only carried four machine guns with a very small caliber weapon. Now the other thing that was a challenge, Greg, and we dealt with this a little bit when we, oops, I knocked it over there. Uh, we dealt with this a little bit with the P-40s. If you remember the P-40s and some of the uh, early Bell aircraft fired through the propeller, what do you end up with when you fight fire through the propeller, Greg? Interrupter gear. What does interrupter gear do? Slows down the rate of fire. So if you're firing a 20 millimeter, 20 millimeter cannon through the prop, that's a fairly large shell, right? You still have a low rate of fire, which is not good. We've talked about a challenge with uh, these higher caliber weapons and the lower rate of fire. But when you're firing through a propeller with a smaller caliber uh, round and you're slowing down the amount of rounds, remember, you want to put as many of those slugs on the enemy as possible and you're slowing them down coming through the propeller, you just cut the amount of firepower in the that the airplane can put out exponentially. So you had this fantastic design, but it was very lightly armed. Now the aircraft uh, did very well uh, in combat. As I said, it had an extremely good uh, uh, kill ratio. Now let's talk about comparable aircraft, Greg, and I want you to pay attention to this because this, is, this will open your eyes. It was comparable to the Hurricane, the P-38, the P-39, the, the uh, P-40, and the Spit Mark V. So when this airplane came into production, it was considered, the Italians had made a decision early on in aircraft design that what they were going to do is stick to radials. And remember, with the Japanese, which we just finished, they were over water, radials made a bunch of sense. But guess where the, guess the neighborhood the Italians were in? They're in a tougher neighborhood, right? and uh, everybody around them is developing really, really good weapons. And so the, um, the, the challenge with this was that uh, when they brought this in, suddenly the French, the British, and the Germans went, they've caught up to us. They, and that was when they dropped the insistence on the radial engine. Now the airplane, as I said, was only produced at about 1,100, 1,150, it was not a, um, a factor in the war, but at that time, it, it was very potent. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the aces in this airplane. There are actually aces in this airplane, Greg. But first, we're gonna get to my stage two. Now my stage two today, again, playing on my Italian heritage, Wise Guy Root Beer. Now, I like Wise Guy Root Beer. Now, this is not totally uh, Italiano. These are the Three Stooges. Woo -woo -woo -woo. But uh, I'm sure someone will yell at me in the comment section for doing that. But uh, let's see. Uh, nutritional facts. 170 calories. Fairly high calorie count. Uh, ooh, lots of sodium in this. Let's see who bottled it. I don't even know. Pure cane sugar, though. If you're going to say mark, mark, market that pure cane sugar pretty aggressively. Now, what I want to talk about today is the uh, fight, especially we're going to talk about the Allies, uh, but the British and the British that fought at Malta and in the Mediterranean. That area, and even with the United States uh, as we came in in Operation Torch, and really was the first defeat for the... Um, for the Germans and the Axis powers and the Vichy French in North Africa. But we really, that whole 
area gets glossed over in the Mediterranean. The British had a tough fight on their hands early on. Uh, there was it was a real scrap with the with the Italians who were uh, who really believed uh, Mussolini really believed that he was going to create the next coming of the Roman Empire, which was just not going to be. But the British held the line and fought in the Mediterranean, and those United States troops and the troops that fought in Italy, they absolutely uh, get no respect, in my opinion, the Rodney Dangerfield, right? No respect. Hey, hey, hey no respect. They got no respect, uh, and there's a lot more uh, uh, emphasis put on D-Day and the fight in uh, Western Europe, but if you fought or your family, whatever nationality, you fought in the Mediterranean, in that area there, I salute you. Ooh, it's fizzing. You know, I have the test, Greg, to see how long it's been on the shelf. This one's bubbling. That's actually, Greg, you're worrying me. This is actually pretty good. So I'm going to have another swig. Mmm. That's very good, Greg. I, you know, you're you're slipping. You're, you, this is uh, two times in a row that you have not uh, tried to poison me there. So, um, the aircraft uh, had aces. Uh, Tariso Vittorio Martinoli was an ace uh, in the airplane. He uh, was killed in a training flight. Now, this is interesting in a P-39. So that is interesting. And then um, Franco. Lacini, I hope, I, again, with, your, with these names, uh, my uh, Italian brother, and I hope I'm not butchering him too much, he was actually killed over Sicily attacking a B-17. So we kind of have both sides. It was, uh, it was a very, very um, good aircraft. It is not rep well represented in museums. If you want to see this aircraft, you're going to have to, and who's going to argue? You're going to have to go to Italy, Craig. We're going to have to go to Italy to cover this airplane because it is completely gone. It's really too bad that we don't see one of these flying in the United States. If you think about it, it would be a fun airplane to see fly. But given the low build numbers, I doubt that you'll ever see this aircraft uh, anywhere, maybe outside Europe. Uh, now, the, uh, it flew as late as 1948 with the Egyptian Air Force. So it continued to fly after the war, which is unique for a lot of Axis aircraft. In other words, we've talked about a few versions, the FW-90 and the ME-262 is shocking that flew for the Czechs for a few years. But this one actually flew in strength for the Egyptian Air Force, and then it was completely retired in 1951, and it went into history. But uh, Mario Castoldi's design uh, was really uh, a an excellent aircraft, and as I said, probably one, one of the best fighters that you've never heard of. Now, if you want to have a fulgore in your living room, you can build this puzzle and get it framed. There's actually, uh, one of the fulgores is actually on there, so you can, the 202, so you can get that uh, and, and have this airplane. This is a great puzzle, and it is suitable for framing. Click on that link, and Jason will happily send one of these out to you. Now, if you want to help us out, remember, we can't do this without your donations. Click on that donation link that's attached with the video. If you've seen us on YouTube and you like Warbird Wednesday, send us to a friend. What is a better gift than the gift of the Fulgore to one of your friends so you can uh, teach them about a, a very unusual Italian airplane? Uh, you can like us on uh, YouTube, uh, subscribe to us on YouTube, like us on Facebook. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thank you so much for visiting with us. Have a great day.